Welcome, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here and talking with you about generative testing, otherwise known as property testing. Uh, this is a talk I gave for Brooklyn JS about a week ago. Um, these are all my social media accounts. Sadly, on Twitter, I had to use an underscore. Oh, well, too bad. Um, so we've got a spec here. Describe it. This could be Mocha. This could be Jest. Uh, any other kind of testing framework. And we're describing our custom sort function. And in this particular unit test, we're showing that a given input should give us a certain output. Namely, sorting 2, 1, 3 should result in 1, 2, 3. Um, and maybe this passes, and that's great. So how confident are you all that my sort function works perfectly at this point? Yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Uh, I'm hearing some, some boos. <laughs> Uh, we might feel really good about this until we realize that this also passes this test, as does this, and all of these very silly uh, implementations for sort also pass this test because they work for this one particular case. So what do we do? What do we, how do we fix this? How would you fix it? Have more tests. Have more tests. Yeah. So we'll say, well, 2, 3, 1 sorts to 1, 2, 3. Uh, 1.5 and negative 4 should be negative 4 and 1.5. Empty should be empty. And oh no, this is unfortunate. Uh, it's kind of a pain, right? Like we're trying to imagine all the different possible ways our code might screw up and individually hand code the examples that show whether or not it is screwing up. Um, but are we more confident? Well, I think uh, we are more confident. I think like through evidence, we have increased the likelihood that our test I mean, that our um, code is correct. Uh, we have at least failed to disprove uh, that it is correct. Uh, and that makes us more confident. But it's definitely flawed. As humans, um, we tend to focus on the happy path, the things that we you know, anticipate or we're thinking, this is the way the code will be used. And we fail to anticipate all the edge cases. Um, this is a really common thing in psychology and coding. We've all experienced it. So surely there's a better way. Um, why do we have this test in the first place? We're testing 2, 1, 3 sorts to 1, 2, 3. Do we care about this particular array? Are we thinking like, you know what, in my code base, there's going to be an array with 2, 1, 3. That's not really what we care about, right? What we care about is that this results in an ordered array. This is a property of our sorting function, that for whatever array goes into it, an ordered array comes out. So we can encapsulate these concepts as laws, laws about our code behavior. Not all code is going to have nice pat laws like this, but you'd be surprised at how much of your code, when you code in a uh, clean, modular, functional style, can have laws. Some of the laws for sorting might be sorting results in an ordered list. Uh, sorting an already sorted list does nothing. Sorting never changes the elements of a list, never drops any or adds any or edits any. So we can actually encapsulate these laws as functions. We could say, look, sort orders things. If you put any array into me, I will give you back whether or not this array is sorted. And I would, I'll say that using a Boolean. So this is a predicate function. Uh, it verifies whether or not this law holds for any given array. It doesn't matter what the details are. All we care about is, you give me a list of numbers, I'll tell you yes or no, your sort function does order the output. Now that we have this generic does the sorting work the way we expect it to function, this law function or property function, um, what are we going to use it with? Well, what if we randomly generate lots of different inputs? OK, so I go over and I hand code laboriously this random integer function and random array function. And this random array function uses my random integer function. And I've got these ad hoc data generators. They can spit out random arrays. Now I can do a loop inside my spec. And I can say, OK, well, let's do some assertions. We will generate a whole bunch of random arrays. We'll sort them. We'll check that the result is ordered. And we will expect that that is the case. We've, we're using that property um, and throwing if it's ever false. Now, maybe that limit test is 10 tests, or 100 tests, or 1,000 tests. But it's parameterizable. You can mess around with it. And maybe this passes, and we feel a lot better. But what happens when it fails? Uh-oh. This is where things go a little awry. So how many of you have ever seen expected false to be true? And you're like, that tells me nothing, test framework. I have no idea what you're talking about. 
Um, that's what we've done here. We're just throwing on an assertion of whether or not some predicate returns true or false. And we might say, well, wait a second. Which input array did I generate that failed? Why did it fail? What did sort even output? Like, what's going on? So I've got a brilliant idea. Once we've encountered this failure, we're going to instrument our tests with some debugging. We'll console log. We'll say, oh, I'll find out which thing is failing, log it, and then I'll go from there. Oops, you saved the test. And we're generating random arrays. That means on this newly uh, saved rerun of the test framework, this time, coincidentally, everything passed. There was this fleeting ship in the night that was your failure, and you failed to catch it. So we're like, OK, we've got non-determinism here. Let's save again. And boom, this time we have at least a failure. Maybe it's the same one from before. Maybe it's a completely different one. And we look at this, and we're like, oh my goodness. Maybe this is a 1,000 element long random array that we happen to generate that failed. And we're like, why on earth does this particular array fail my sort? When I'm dealing with random inputs that might fail, maybe the random thing that fails is much bigger than it needs to be to illustrate why it fails. So we're on the right track. We're using dynamic JavaScript and programming to create test uh, unit tests, uh, to test lots of potential inputs, including cases maybe we as humans are failing to think about. But it's a whole lot trickier than we expected. We've got these laborious, ad hoc, error-prone data generators that have to code by hand. By the way, of course you probably didn't notice this because I grayed it out and I kind of de-emphasized the implementation details. But my random int function never generates negative integers. I just didn't think about it when I was writing my randint. It's between 0 and something. So really easy to still miss edge cases here, especially if I'm doing this reinventing the wheel. Um, maybe my random data generator constructs the same arrays a couple times when it doesn't need to. My failures are non-instructive. I don't know what input failed. I don't know what output resulted. I don't know why anything failed. And it's irreproducible. It's all random, so I can't go back and say, like, wait, I want to debug the code path that led to that failure. I want to put in debugger statements. I want to do stepping through my code. Nope, it's gone, because it's random. Uh, and your failing cases might be unnecessarily large. They might not illustrate your edge case or your, your, um, your border, your boundary, your error boundary. They might just be this random large one fails, but also a smaller one might have failed. So surely there is a better way again. And there is. They're called property testing libraries. The idea is not a new one. Uh, John Hughes and Cohen Clayson uh, wrote this famous paper for Haskell. Uh, which is on a library called QuickCheck, which has now been taken over by other people. Uh, and QuickCheck is such a good idea and has been so successful that it's been ported to many other languages, including JavaScript. The um, slightly older and larger project in JS for this is called JS Verify. Uh, but the library that I've been using more recently that I think is uh, a bit better maintained and has some very interesting features is called FastCheck. So what is a property testing library? We write functions that indicate the laws or properties our code is supposed to have. They encapsulate as a predicate our behavior that we expect. Things like sorting a sorted list is a no-op. Um, it doesn't have to be a synchronous bool, you know, true-false. It can be a promise for a bool or something like that. So async is supported. Um, then the system generates progressively bigger random inputs for you. And not only this, because this is baked into the library, and people have thought very carefully about these data generators and designed them and explored the space and written papers, they encapsulate all sorts of edge cases you're probably going to forget if you try to reinvent the wheel. Things like the empty string, or negative numbers, or floats, or stuff that's very, very, very small, or very, very, very big. Now, the cool thing is, if it does fail, it doesn't just say, oh, here's the failure, the end. It says, oh, not only can I generate larger and larger data that's random, but if I have a piece of data that is problematic, it causes my law to fail, I can shrink the data. I can progressively simplify it according to the rules for that data generator over and over again until I get the minimal failing edge case, the smallest counterexample that still fails your predicate. 
So it finds the error boundaries for you. And it's not random. It's deterministic. It's pseudo-random. It does not use math.random directly. It uses a pseudo-random generator, which means you can feed it a seed and replay your failing case and debug it exactly as it failed. So you can just go ahead and do it manually. What does it look like? Well, it looks like this. You import some stuff from a library, and then you construct a thing called a property. This is the library construct. It's the thing that encapsulates all the magic behind the scenes. And the property takes two things. It takes inputs that you specify. In this case, to say, hey, fast check, give me random arrays of integers. And then it takes your law, your function, that tests those inputs. So given my random array of integers, I'll return true or false whether or not my law holds. Does sorting those numbers result in an ordered list? And just to connect this to our testing framework, there's a helper method called assert, which takes one of these properties and reruns it many times and throws an error if it ever fails. So that's just a binding between uh, the library and a typical test framework like Mocha. So maybe it now passes, and that's great, and we feel great about that. But if it doesn't, this is where it comes into its own, and it shines. If it fails, it fails elegantly. It says, hey, I ran your code. I tried up to four inputs this time before I came across a problem, an input, a random array of integers that failed your law. And once I came across that failure, I was able to progressively simplify it down seven steps to result in this. This very small counterexample fails your law. Some, for some reason, your sort does not output an, a sorted or ordered result after sorting negative one comma negative two. And now you're thinking, oh, wow, this is so much easier for me to reason about and test and think about and maybe manually or conceptually plug into my function and see like what happens when it sorts just these two numbers and realize, oops, I see what the problem is. But maybe you don't see it offhand and you just want to try it. You want to like debug this thing. Maybe it's part of a larger, more complicated code path. So it says, here's the seed. You want to rerun exactly this code, plug this back into the framework, and I will rerun those counterexamples specifically for you. That's the idea. It'll even tell you, like, this is the simplification. I initially encountered a failure that looked like this big, large, crazy thing, and I was able to simplify it down to negative 1, negative 2, fails your test. Now you might say, OK, well, arrays of integers, that's not so fancy. I need like this very specific data structure where this thing has to relate to this thing, and it's got to be only so long, and it's got to have some JSON. And that's fine. There are all sorts of clever ways you can use this library. Um, if you need more than one input, you just add more of these data generators to your property. So here there are two Booleans that I want to test. And you just keep chaining them in as arguments to your function. Uh, maybe you want to combine data into richer, more complex forms of data. These things are combinator functions. That means they work on each other to build up complexity. So it can have an array of anything or a function that returns bools. It can even generate random functions for you. And you can test those things. Um, and not only that, because this is a functional library, this is going to have all the beautiful things like map and filter that you expect out of functional design patterns. So if I have a, gener a data generator for random integers, and I want a data generator for random odd integers, I can map my original data generator to result in a new data generator and transform the values it produces. I can filter them down. I can do all sorts of stuff. And there's a whole bunch more. We're not going to go into it. It's very complicated. There's tons of uh, interesting tutorials, advanced use cases. But the simple stuff you just saw, and it can actually work really well for certain cases. There are even monads. OK, so quick summary. This doesn't replace testing as you know it. This is one more form of testing, which slots in around unit testing, fuzzers, um, you know, monkey testing, static analysis, uh, component testing, integration testing, etc. It's just one more tool in your tool bag. It integrates very easily with any kind of testing framework because it's just plain JavaScript. It doesn't require special binders or anything. You can convert it to an assertion just by using that assert helper. And that's it. Thank you very much.
any 